do to them. Okay. Hello, and welcome to Love and Lordship Live once again. I'm Greg Williams, your host, and we're going to continue with our series on lessons from characters of Advent and Christmas. However, you knew when I put out the Love and Lordship Live Facebook yesterday, we moved from noon to 11, that there were technical and scheduling difficulties. So here we are. We're glad to be here, and I hope you are too. Thanks for joining us, and invite your family and friends right now for the next 20, 25 minutes. We're going to talk about what we can learn. I've entitled it this, by the way, Christmas and the Gospel According to the Shepherds. God's grace is for all. Now, I begin today from an excerpt by an article by a, a man who read, wrote an article called The Real Shepherds of Bethlehem. His name was Nick Harris. I encourage you to go read the full article. It's great. Uh, matter of fact, I'll probably find it and put it in the comments for you because it's a fabulous article. So I'm going to hit the highlights because it leads into some of the lessons we can learn from the shepherds and what God was telling us about his love and his grace for us. You see, on that very first Christmas night, there were shepherds tending huge flocks of sheep in fields near the village of Bethlehem. And it was a village. It wasn't a big town or anything. As they know from history, and even today, it's not that big. This, however, large herds of, flo of flocks of sheep, I should say. They're not herds. They're flocks. Large flocks of sheep was very unusual to be near a population area, a village, a town, a city anyway. Why? Because... The odor, I don't know about you, I grew up on a farm, okay? We had some goats, we had many cattle, we were, had a dairy farm. When you walked into that barn, or when those, especially in the heat of summer, when those cattle were up grazing near the house, you knew it, okay? You knew by the smell, all right? And it's the same issue that they would have. So normally, the flocks of sheep, the huge flocks of sheep, would be kept far away from any residential areas. Right? because the odor was so bad. So large flocks were confined to areas far from these places. So they wouldn't have to deal with that. Bethlehem, however, and especially at that time of the year, and you're going to find out why in just a minute, was an exception. You see, for 30 days, once a year, an enormous flock of one-year-old, perfect, spotless lambs, that ought to give you a clue, grazed near Bethlehem, and at that time of year, it was 30 days prior to Passover. The sheep in that particular location near Bethlehem that these people had to put up with the stench, all right, belonged to the high priest and his family, and they were for the Passover sacrifice for all the people and for the priests so that the high priest could go into God's presence in the Holy of Holies. The Bethlehem shepherds knew who they were guarding. They knew these were the Passover lambs, the unblemished, set apart, to be sacrificed right there in the temple for Passover lambs. The sizes of these flocks requires a huge amount of shepherds watching in shifts, much like we have jobs in factories or whatever today. So likely when the angel appeared, it was the third shift. They would have been the lowliest of low shepherds. They would have gotten the worst shift. Okay? That's who God chose to appear to. Some watched while others slept. While shepherds watched their flocks by night, the angel appeared unto them. You see? Bethlehem itself was a very interesting place. In the time of Jesus, it was very picturesque. It sat upon a, a series of limestone cliffs, still does today for the most part, but you could see off that cliff of Bethlehem in many directions. The grazing fields where these Passover lambs were kept, the temple shepherds watched them, was in a valley south and east of the town beneath that cliff. In the middle of this pasture was a structure known as the Migdal Eater. Not eater, eater, E D E R, Migdal Eder, or the Tower of the Flock. It was not used by the shepherds. No, they, they better not go up in it, and here's why. It was used by the priests. They were the ones that were overseeing the shepherds that were overseeing the Passover lambs. You see, the priests, by remaining in the Migdal Eder, the Tower of the Flock, were able to keep themselves from being defiled. 
there's no way we can enter into the temple and into God's presence if we get down there among the sheep. So we'll watch from the tower, the Migdal Eater, and you shepherds stay down there. And because you're down there, the shepherds, on the other hand, remained in a defiled condition. In amongst the filthy sheep, the feces of the sheep, and everything else that was in that in that those pasture lands. So the, the shepherds were not allowed to enter God's presence offer sacrifices or go into the synagogues or the temples. Any religious experience that the shepherds might have was between himself and God. Very personal. And yet, any Jew of that time, especially those who were temple authorities, the idea of worshiping God individually or personally was disgusting. If you didn't do it in the temple, you were a castaway. You starting to get the picture? See, for all these reasons, even the most pious shepherds were labeled unclean and according to the law and the authorities could never enter the presence of God. Not as long as they were there amongst the sheep. However, it was these unclean, ritually contaminated shepherds. The ones in Bethlehem, the Passover lambs, don't miss that, that would be the first to experience God's word revealed to them about the living word. The angel appeared to the Bethlehem shepherds. Oh, the audacity of God that he would show up to them instead of the ones that were sure he was going to show up to the temple priests and the Levites and those who were regularly clean and could go to the temple. Surely that's where God would appear to the intellectual and spiritual giants who were found in the temple. But you see, God had a plan always does, even the least among us are invited to have a relationship with his son. None of us are excluded. We do not need to be theologians or ritually pure to enjoy this Christmas relationship. However, because of that spotless lamb, that babe in the manger, we simply must be willing to come as we are just as the shepherd did, just as the Bethlehem defiled shepherds did. They listened to the shepherd, the angels, and they made their way to Bethlehem. And they were the first, other than Joseph and Mary, to see God in the flesh. Emmanuel. So, what is the gospel? What is Christmas according to the shepherds? You see, oftentimes in the Christmas story, we focus on the main characters, Mary and Joseph, and, and of course Jesus, maybe Elizabeth and Zacharias and John the Baptist who preceded Jesus and Anna and Simeon, because they were all temple people. They could go in the temple, right? And of course, Mary and Joseph were the earthly, the mother and the earthly father of Jesus, so they're, they're quite important. But through the short account of Luke, Luke 1, 8, or I'm sorry, Luke 2, 8 through 20, we can learn from the shepherds four things that should make the top of our to-do list this and every Advent and Christmas season and every day. What can we learn from the lowliest of low shepherds and their response to God and his revealed word through the angels? Keep in mind who those shepherds were in the world's eyes and their intimate understanding regarding the perfect, unblemished Passover lambs. First thing we can learn, they believed. They chose faith over fear. The angels said, do not fear, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Peace on earth among people with whom God is pleased. Who's that? It's those who respond to God's gift through faith. Scripture says, for by grace you are saved through faith, Ephesians 2, 8. Well, that's exactly what the shepherds did. You see, faith means you say yes to all that God did through Christ. Yes, he is the Savior of the world. Yes, he came to die for my sins. Yes, through him I find forgiveness and new life. Yes, I want to follow Christ as Lord. Faith isn't a spectator sport. It's an active embracing of all that Christ has d done that God promised and he fulfilled. The shepherds had a choice when they heard from the angels to make, and they did just that. You see, number two is faith without works is dead. That's James 2.17, I believe, but it isn't James. So what did they do? They acted on that faith. They obeyed. Luke 2.15. 
The shepherds did exactly as they were told. You see, faith without obedience is actually no faith at all. Their obedience reflected their faith. They took what the angel and the angel said, and they acted on it. Otherwise, they would have never arrived in Bethlehem at the stable, at the manger, and seen God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. They would have missed that. They could have said, oh, that was really nice. That angel visited us. Wow, that's great. Huh, but I can't leave these Passover lambs, and I'm not so sure. That sounds kind of far-fetched that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe, which we'll talk about more next week, all right? I'm not so sure that he's going to arrive in a stinking stable, in a manger, in a feed box, in swaddling clothes, poor man's cloths. We'll just stay here in the fields. <laughs> you see, faith requires obedience, even when they couldn't see it. Let me state that one other way. Every step from the angel's word in the fields in Bethlehem was a step of faith until they actually saw him in the manger. That's what faith does. That's number three. Their faith became sight. So what did they do? The same thing we should do in Luke 2, 16 through 18. They told others. Who do you need to tell about the great message of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world? Faith, every step of the way, had now become sight. They were the first, besides Joseph and Mary, to see the Son of God. What would they do with what they had been entrusted with? Well, let's see what the word said. When the shepherds arrived in Bethlehem and saw the child lying in the feed trough in the manger, imagine that was kind of smelly as well, okay? They spread the word concerning what they had been told them about this child. You see, it would have been quite spectacular to find any baby in a manger, but the exact baby wrapped in the exact cloths in a stable in a manger that the angel had said, that's where you're going to find him, not in a palace, not in a temple, but in a manger in a stable. Whoa, what the angel said has to be true because we wouldn't find the king of kings and lord of lords there. We would never expect to. So we got to go tell others. They weren't preachers, teachers, missionaries. That didn't matter. They had heard and seen the salvation for the whole world. What else could they do? They told others. And fourth, the fourth thing that they did and that we can do as well, they experienced his presence. You know how I know that? Because in Luke 2.20, it says they worshipped God. The shepherds were overwhelmed at what they saw. They experienced holy wonder. The angels told us an unbelievable story. There's no way God would come to earth as the Savior and be born in a manger. We're going to check this out by faith. They did. How could we do anything but worship God? This isn't going to work any other way. He should have come in a palace. He should have had crowns and gold and, 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 and kings bowing down and worship to him. He's in a manger and shepherds are worshiping him. God's grace is for all. You see, amidst all the activity, the, they, they stopped. Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in their hearts and then engaged. So I'm saying to you, you stop right now. It's been crazy. That's why our schedule's been crazy, okay? But you stop and treasure all the things like Mary did, and then you do what the, the shepherds did. You ponder, and you think on them, and then you engage in some holy wonder. You worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that baby in a manger who left it empty and left the cross empty and left the tomb empty. I'm going to close with this. Two little stories that tie together here. Chuck Swindoll, a great biblical teacher, once penned his thoughts about the first humans other than Joseph and Mary, we've made that clear, right? To see Jesus as a baby, as a human being in the flesh, God with us. He has a unique perspective because he uh, was, is talking about a visit that he and his wife went to the Holy Land a few years ago. Here, listen to his experience in Israel and ponder its compelling impact on your own heart, okay? Cynthia and I were touring Israel with the ministry, as our motor coach passed through the Judean wilderness, I spied some people living in tents and tending goats, sheep, Bedouins, our guide sneered. Have you ever met one? Chuck said. I'll never forget his answer. Why in the world would I, and I'm adding this because of the way it sounds, or anyone 
want to do that. They're Bedouins. As we drove on, Chuck says, it struck me that the Bible has another name for Bedouins. Shepherds. Contrary to most Christmas pageants, these shepherds weren't clean people in terry cloths and soft rubber sandals. They were nobodies nobody cared to know. Society's leftover who looked after stinking animals. Since that day, I've never read Luke's gospel the same way. There were shepherds keeping watch over their flocks in the fields by night. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news, which will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born unto you this day in the city of David in Bethlehem. Luke 2, 8 through 11. The shepherds were stunned, not just because they were terrified, but because the Lord had proclaimed his message to all people, even them. In light of God's boundless grace, they felt compelled. Back to our lessons, right? We've heard. What do we do? We act in faith. We obey. They felt compelled to go see Jesus and exclaim to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Luke 2, 15. But that wasn't their only response. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened. They were compelled to go to Jesus, and then having met him, they were compelled to make him known. Chuck went on to say, having met Jesus, I am continuously compelled to make him known. His grace and his love compels me to do the same. And look at how his grace makes a difference. He tells of a lady who listens to his broadcast named Cheryl, who wrote into him, I am just a nobody, single mom, who works overnight in a grocery store stocking shelves. That's when I listen to your podcasts. The messages have blessed me and made me feel strong when I have felt very, so very weak from the challenges of life. That's what Jesus offers. And Cheryl is one of thousands, and there are millions more who need to hear that God's Word, living in Christ and written in His Word, the Bible, is for everyone. It's for all people. When they do, they will be compelled to go to Jesus, and having met him, they will be compelled to make him known. You see, just last week, after we talked about the stories of Advent and Christmas, about Mary and Joseph, I had a young man contact me. Similar story. I, he messaged me and said, we're, we're in a tough situation. And he'll know who I'm talking about if he's listening again or if he hears this again. So I wanted to reach out again because I messaged you back. And I told you we'd love to help. Need to know a little bit more about where you are and how we can do that. And would love to talk with you. But he saw a newborn baby, a new baby on the way, rather, just a few weeks. They have a, a trailer that needs some insulation and an electric bill paid by today. We can help. Contact me. You see, God's grace and his love is for all. But it's not just so that you continue to live the way you are to the young man who contacted me, to everyone who's listening, and to myself. He changes our lives so that we will live for him. Here are four things you can do in this Advent and Christmas season. Like the shepherds, you can engage in holy wonder. Number one, stop in the middle of your shopping, whether it's online or out in the COVID distance stores. I think I want to say stores. Yeah, stores. Stop, take the time to read through the Christmas story. There's parts of it in Isaiah, there's parts of it in Malachi, there's all over the Old Testament, but get to it in Matthew 1 and 2 and in Luke 1 and 2. Take some time to read through it and think about what you've just heard. Number two, gather your children or friends around a nativity scene each night and unwrap a different piece and talk about the role that that person or that item plays in the Advent and the Christmas story of God coming to man. Number three, wake up early one morning, or every morning, and find a place where you can watch the sunrise as you meditate again on Luke 1, 76 through 79. You see, there's several things you can do, and then let me add this. As the Holy Spirit works on you, number four, respond to Jesus. Give your life to Him. Be obedient. 
I promise you, not, your whole circumstances may not change, but your heart will. And he will begin to work in and through that for your good and for his glory. We've heard God's message. We've been compelled to go to Jesus, and having met him, we're compelled to make him known. This December and every day, let's remember those who feel like Bedouins, like nobodies, nobody cares to know. And together, like those first lonely shepherds, let's proclaim the good and great news. God's grace is for all. If you need help, young man, if, you, if you're hearing this again, reach out again. If you need help, contact us at Love and Worship. We want to help you. We certainly can meet with you and, and share some more of this message with you. If we can, we can help in other ways, and we'll be prayerful and careful to do that if we can. You can reach us at loveandwardship at gmail.com, loveandwardship at gmail.com, or my cell is 859-229-6504. I'll have scriptures, quotes, and summary in the comments. You can check it out there. Now, it's, it's year-end for us. It's a huge time for ministries and nonprofits. If you can help us in any way, we would appreciate that. Please pray for us. Secondly, if you can give, if the Lord's laid it on your heart, and, and you are listening to Him, be willing to give to love and worship. We don't charge for any of these things, so we're doing them knowing that God will provide, and He has. So if He leads you to do that, there's going to be three or four different ways you can do that. Once or ongoing in the comments or on our website, loveandwardship.com. So we ask you to prayerfully consider that. And then if he's prompting you to do that, follow through. We pray blessings on you and your family at this time. But if it's not us, ask him who he wants you to give to. I'm always going to say that. Because I know it's not who gets it, it's who's giving it and how the Lord blesses that. If we are being faithful, he'll find a way to bless us. And he'll do the same for you. So thank you for that consideration. Love and Worship is here to help you live joyfully and to have healthy and fulfilling relationships in the Love and Worship of Jesus Christ, the baby who came in the manger, Emmanuel, God with us. We don't charge, so we rely on donations, but we're going to be there as long as the Lord allows us to be through these types of, of interactions, through one-on-one -on -one with couples and men and with others, and we want to be there to help you. So please reach out if you need to. Also, if your church or group would like to have Love and Worship come. The Authority of Love, the book, is available. We're hoping it's in print this week. We're very close. Please pray for that. It's going to be out there along with the digital versions on Amazon and Google. Check that out as well. And thank you if you buy that. We appreciate that. It helps us. And we're giving 20% of that to other ministries. Lord, lay that on my heart right away. We desire to make disciples who make disciples in every home, in every church, in Christ. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for your prayers. Thanks always to the Lord. Have a wonderful day and Advent and Christmas season in Christ. And God bless.